Aldo Pantano is from the state's Office of Policy and Management Agency and represents the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care. He speaks frequently on the topic of long-term care insurance and related topics. Aldo is also responsible for training insurance agents through the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care Producer Certification Training Program. In addition, he works closely with consumers and insurance agents to answer questions about the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care, Medicaid, Medicare, and long-term care insurance. Aldo has been with the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care for 13 years. Prior to joining the state, he spent 24 years in the private insurance industry. In his last six years with the private sector, Aldo served as a sales executive promoting and selling group long-term care insurance to employers with 500 or more employees traveling throughout the country. Aldo holds a BA degree in marketing from the University of Hartford. So we welcome Aldo. All right, thank you so much, Christina, and a big thanks to everyone for joining us, as well as Jenna Anthony at the library for uh, helping to host uh, tonight's session. Um, unfortunately, we have a problem paying for long-term care in Connecticut and in the rest of the country as well. And that's because of many misunderstandings, misconceptions, confusion. Uh, and tonight we'll try to clarify that with the first misunderstanding being around what long-term care is and what long-term care is not. Long-term care is not health care. If somebody falls down and breaks a leg, ends up in the hospital, you have doctors, nurses providing skilled care, x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans. The primary purpose is to help fix what's broken and move on. With long-term care, also known as custodial care, we are referring to situations where people simply need help with everyday activities such as bathing, dressing, continence, eating, transferring, toileting, or they may need long-term care because of a cognitive impairment such as Alzheimer's, so they need guidance or supervision to help them stay safe. The majority of long-term care is provided at home, and you also have some settings like assisted living facility, home or uh, adult daycare, and the two words we don't want to hear where 15% or so of the people who need long-term care receive care, it's in, in nursing homes. Uh, the, the purpose with long-term care is to help maintain uh, the individual's uh, current status to prevent it from de deteriorating quickly and, and have them have comfortable uh, throughout the day uh, and help them as needed. The, uh, again, most people rather stay at home and that's where most of the long-term care is provided. Another misconception is the risk of long-term care. Most people think that long-term care is only for the elderly, but reality is unfortunately different where close to 40% of the people who need long-term care are under the age of 65. If we're fortunate to reach age 65, every other person will need some level of long-term care. And unfortunately for women, uh, as women live longer, the older we are, the greater the chance of needing some type of long-term care. And Alzheimer's seems to favor women. Now, experts don't fully agree, but the thinking is that the older we are, the greater the chance that we'll need some assistance and possibly develop Alzheimer's. A friend of mine's sister at age 49 was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She passed away in a nursing home at age 55. Another friend right now, his wife, she's 54, 55. She has Alzheimer's, has been dealing with it for a few years, and they're trying different um, approaches to try to control the situation as best as possible. And lastly, another friend of mine's mother uh, had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Fortunately, they had four daughters, two sons, and the husband. They all took care of her and kept her comfortable at home until she passed away. So uh, if these conditions continue, it's especially important for women to think about how you can protect your lifestyle, how you can have a lot more choices should you need long-term care, and also how to protect your assets because the cost of long-term care is extremely high, and I'll talk more about that. And if we're not prepared for it, uh, it's a tragedy when someone uh, 
uh, has to start spending their assets and become poor because they're paying for long-term care. So is there a better way to do this? And this is what I will discuss throughout here. Another misconception is the cost of long-term care. Uh, many of us don't realize that where the cost of living is high, the cost of care is high as well. In the Northeast, it's one of the more expensive areas in the country. Connecticut is the second, the second most expensive state in the country when it comes to the cost of nursing homes. The most expensive is Alaska. Now in Alaska, you're paying about $950 a day in a nursing home or close to over $350,000 a year. Now in Connecticut, we're not paying that kind of money, but we're still paying a lot. The average daily benefit amount cost is $444 a day. So many nursing homes in Connecticut are charging 550, 500. That's close to give or take $163,000 a year. And as you can imagine, most of us are not prepared to pay this kind of expense on a yearly basis, which may force us to become poor quickly. So if we can transfer the risk from ourselves to some other organization, then perhaps uh, we, we won't have to invest our assets should we need long-term care in the, in the future. Um, one thing I want to mention on this slide here is we talked about the daily benefit, the average cost of care in a nursing home. Since 1988, we monitor the cost of increases in nursing homes. We do a survey every fall and we publish results in the spring. In our website, there's a cost of care booklet which shows you the cost of care for a lot of different settings by town. So. I'll tell you more about the website uh, a little bit later. Uh, so you can download the publication Cost of Care and, and you can see what the charges are throughout Connecticut. The average inflation since 1988 is at 4.8%. Now, I don't know if we can think of them as good news. Over the last eight years, the increases in the cost of care have been a lot closer to 2%. So for over the last eight years, cost of nursing homes has increased closer to 2% a year. And that's where we're at uh, today. Obviously, we don't know what five, 10 years will look like down the road. Now, if long-term care is so expensive, who's paying for it? As you can see here, you have the 22 or so percent where people are paying out of pocket and eventually they may become poor and qualify for Medicaid. You have over 10 million people that have purchased long-term care policies throughout the country and over 60,000 people in Connecticut have purchased this special program called the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care. With Medicaid, Nobody wants to spend down their assets to poverty level so that they can qualify for Medicaid, but unfortunately, it is a safety net for many people. As a single person, we have to spend down our assets to $1,600, and then we're allowed to keep $60 a month of income, or 60 plus 90 if you're a wartime veteran. And then you qualify for, let's say, the nursing home and Medicaid will pay for it. For married people, the state doesn't want the community spouse to become poor just because the other spouse needs long-term care services. As a married couple, the community spouse living at home gets to protect the house and the car regardless of value and then up to 50% of the other assets, but no more, and this figure just came out for January 1st, 130,380. I'll repeat that. A married couple, if one spouse is in the nursing home, the community spouse living at home gets to protect the house 
the car, regardless of value, up to 50% of their other assets, but no more than 100 and 30,380, new figure that we, we got to remember here. Notice that Medicare is not even listed here, and that's another misconception. People think Medicare will pay for everything. Medicare was not designed to pay for nursing homes. Medicaid was designed to help for women and children, and because Medicare turns away many people who apply for long-term care payments, uh, eventually end up qualifying for Medicaid because they become poor, and that safety net of Medicaid will not be there for the people truly needed if we keep going at the pace that we're going in. So Medicare, on average, pays for about 25 days in a nursing home, no more than 100 days. It's difficult to qualify for long-term care under Medicare because it has to be very specific situations, such as, for example, somebody falls down, breaks a hip, is hospitalized at least three days without counting the day of discharge. And then the person can go to a nursing home for three, four weeks or a re rehabilitation. And there's very good chance the person is going to recover uh, therefore, if somebody needs help with just eating, dressing, walking, bathing, going to the bathroom, the activities of daily living, Medicare won't pay for it. If you need guidance or supervision because of a cognitive impairment, Medicare won't pay for it. If you need seven days a week, 24 hours a day, Medicare won't pay for it. That's why, unfortunately, many people rely on Medicaid. And they have to be poor. Uh, or spend down assets before they can qualify. Now, why is the state even interested in discussing uh, long-term care? Uh, a big reason is because the risk is high. I mean, it is part of life. The older we get, the greater the chance something can happen, and we don't have to be that much older for something to happen. I recently had a bike accident, and there was a lot of fun. Um, Car accidents, sports injuries, long-lasting disease or disability, MS, Parkinson's. You just don't know what life uh, is around the corner. I was just speaking with a lady today because a lot of people call us when they need help with the insurance company or any questions they have with there to help. And she told me that she had qualified for long-term care insurance. I'm assuming her age was maybe 55. And what happened was in February of this year, she was walking on vacation in Mexico. She was walking on a sidewalk and a car hit her on the sidewalk. And now she's been needing long-term care and she says she will recover, but uh, you just don't know what can happen. Obviously we hope that it will never happen. So in Connecticut and in the Northeast, the cost of care is very high. Uh, and we should try not to have to pay for it out of our pocket. The Affordable Care Act, Medicare, health insurance, do not really pay for long-term care. They may pay some small amounts. With Medicaid, you have to be poor before Medicaid will uh, consider someone eligible. And lastly, another reason we talk about long-term care is because of this special program called the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care. Now, I want to mention one thing. There are some people here tonight that possibly may have already purchased non-partnership policies or partnership policies or may not have any insurance. And it's an individual choice. And just because you have a non-partnership policy, that does not mean you don't have a good policy. It comes down to the advice your financial advisor insurance agent provided and, and what plans, plan of benefits you have. If at some point you have questions and you would like to discuss with me or with us at the partnership to see what's important with your policy, I can help, help out as well and other people with the partnership can help out as well. In 1992, the state of Connecticut was very proactive and introduced the first 
partnership program in the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Today, we're happy to see that there are 45 states with partnership programs. The five states that don't have partnership programs include Alaska, Hawaii, Mississippi, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Massachusetts and Vermont have talked about it in the past, but they haven't uh, made a move to offer such a program at this point. And obviously they know what's best for them and with everything that's going on in the country these days, the partnership may not be such a high priority in the states that do not have partnership programs. The partnership program was created with four goals. First of all, to help us Connecticut residents have a better way to protect our assets and reduce the financial risks associated with a long lasting disease or disability that requires long-term care. So the state did a lot of research thanks to back then Governor Bill O'Neill. The conclusion was that even if somebody was able to buy long-term care insurance, he would have to buy unlimited coverage to never run out of insurance and unlimited coverage is very expensive and insurance companies are not offering it anymore. But the state came up with a unique solution, which says they guarantee us, those of us that take responsibility to protect ourselves against the expenses of long-term care and by purchasing a Connecticut partnership policy, we are guaranteed that we can protect a lot more of our assets should we run out of insurance and we still need care. Therefore, I mentioned before, a single person in Connecticut has to spend down his or her assets to $1,600. However, if this person had a partnership policy that, for example, paid $200,000, then this individual would be able to go on Medicaid protecting the $1,600 like everybody else, plus $200,000. And the beauty of this program is that once we protect assets, we can do whatever we want. We can give it all away, give it away partially, spend it periodically, buy pizza and, and wine on Friday nights for everybody in the uh, uh, building, wherever we are. Nobody is going to tell you how you need to spend those assets. And I'm going to give you some examples to make it clear how it works shortly. Another uh, goal here, if the state was going to enter into a partnership with insurance companies, we wanted to make sure that partnership policies would have to meet much higher standards than non-partnership policies. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. The third, as we're doing here tonight, in normal times, I talked to about 1,000 people in different libraries, different settings, town halls throughout the state. Right now we can't meet, so we are fortunate to rely on, 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 on great libraries that are helping out in hosting these programs. And so we wanna try to help people be better informed so that people can make a decision that works best for them should they decide to approach uh, an insurance agent or someone who offers uh, quotes for partnership policies and we'll see where to go from there. The fourth goal is to, for the partnership to conserve state Medicaid funds. Since 1992, there's a formula in place that shows that more than $62 million have been saved for the Medicaid program because of people buying partnership policies and these policies have all been comprehensive in nature except for a small percentage uh, and include very strong inflation protection. Therefore, about 95% of the people who have filed claims and more than $460 million in claims have been paid. More than 95% of these partnership policyholders who filed their claim had more than enough insurance and they never ran out of insurance. Obviously, as people are getting older, there will be more claims that are filed and the savings 
will be even greater to the state Medicaid funds. And we may have more people that run out of insurance. And then the guarantee that the state is making of extra asset protection will come into play. And this is how it works. When we look at a partnership policy, we're buying insurance just like any other insurance out there, whether it's homeowner's insurance, life insurance, disability, automobile insurance. We pay premium to the insurance company. We have a contract with the insurance company. We hope we never need it. But like that time, 10 years ago or so, tree landed on top of my house. We were sleeping underneath the place where the tree landed. Luckily, it didn't go much further than it did, but $16,000 of damage in three seconds. I mean, that's why we buy insurance for, for the unpredictable and also to hopefully reduce our expense should a situation come up. So we buy a partnership policy and it comes with insurance provisions and it also comes with something that the state is doing for us, which is a Medicaid asset protection account. This account starts out as zero value. If someday we file a claim when the insurance company pays insurance benefits, that gives us an equivalent value of how much assets we are protecting. So every $1 paid by the insurance company for your policy, it's $1 of Medicaid asset protection. So if the policy pays 50,000 in five months, you have the value of 50,000 of Medicaid asset protection. After one year, let's say the policy paid $100,000, now you have accumulated 100,000 of Medicaid asset protection. It's like a frequent flyer program. The more you fly with an airline company, the more miles you get. Someday you'll be lucky if you get a free trip. With the Medicaid asset protection, you're not getting a free trip, but what we're, what we're getting is the right to protect a larger amount of assets should we run out of insurance and need Medicaid to help us pay for the extra care that we need. So as it says here on the slide, when determining eligibility, the Department of Social Services is the agency that processes Medicaid claims. They will disregard any assets that you have up to the amount that the partnership policy has paid in benefits. So the Medicaid asset protection provision is a very powerful and beneficial provision. And again, I mentioned, we talked to a lot of people. Sometimes you have a son or daughter, didn't even know the mother or the father had a partnership policy. And then when they start learning how it works and, and the mother or father can practically give the house away to them immediately without any fear of penalties through Medicaid. Obviously people are ecstatic when, they, when that happens, but let me tell you a little bit more how Medicaid asset protection works. You have four people here, Alice, Bob, Cindy, and Dave. Took, took us a week to come up with those names. Um, and you have the assets for each person. You have the column with the Connecticut Partnership for Long-Term Care, policy benefit payments. And this is how much the policy paid or not. And then the fourth column is countable assets. And that is how Medicaid will review each situation. Alice here is based on a real example. Grandmother had $100,000 in assets. <coughs> Excuse me. She heard about the partnership, met with an agent certified to sell partnership policies. And she said, Alice, you have $100,000 in assets to protect 100,000. You first must buy a partnership policy that pays a pool of money worth $100,000. And that's what Alice did. Unfortunately for her, two years later, she developed Alzheimer's, filed a claim with the insurance company, insurance company begins to pay benefits. Let's say a little bit over a year or so, $100,000 is paid by the policy. She has no more insurance. She still needs care, files a claim with Medicaid. Medicaid says, Alice, 
you're single and you have 100,000, you have to spend it down to $1,600 before you qualify for Medicaid. But Alice shows Medicaid the quarterly reports required by state law for the insurance company to send to Alice and to us at the Office of Policy and Management to make sure these reports are mailed. And the reports show you exactly how much the partnership policy paid out. The Medicaid area confirms with the insurance company and gets some other reports that show that Alice has earned the right to protect 100,000. Therefore, Medicaid says, Alice, you have 100,000. You have earned the right to protect 100,000. From Medicaid's perspective, she has zero countable assets, although she owns $100,000. So Alice immediately takes $100,000, transfers it to her daughter to help pay for the grandchildren's education and other expenses. And then Alice went on to live four more years throughout where Medicaid paid for those four years. And here's someone like Alice in some circles with limited assets. However, she was able to achieve the equivalent of unlimited coverage because her assets were first protected through the time when the policy was paying insurance benefits. And then once she transferred her assets, she did whatever she wanted to do with them. She got Medicaid to help pay for the additional care she needed until she passed away. Bob is the same example. He has $200,000 in assets, buys a policy that pays $200,000. He has $200,000 of Medicaid asset protection. Before he runs out of insurance, he applies to Medicaid. Medicaid says, Bob, you have $200,000 in assets. You have earned the right to protect those $200,000. So Medicaid says, Bob, you have zero countable assets. Now, Bob can do different things. First, he can keep it all. If a renewal 200,000 has grown to 220,000 and it's still under his name, the extra 20,000 must be spent down because you only get to protect the original amount. Bob, let's say if he's married, he transfers 200,000 to his wife. Once the assets are transferred to anybody, spouse, friend, relative, religious organization, it does not matter what happens to those assets because they're no longer under Bob's name. And if they grow to 220,000, there is no action required by Medicaid. Those are protected assets and they're gone. Bob can give it away a little bit at a time or can spend it down again at will. Cindy here is an example of the equity of the program. She's single, all these people are single for these examples. She has $1 million in assets. The certified partnership agent explained, Cindy, if you wish to protect 1 million, you must first buy a policy that is a pool of money, lifetime maximum of 1 million, and someday you file a claim and the policy pays 1 million, then you have earned the right to protect 1 million. Cindy decides that the cost for $1 million policies above what she wants to spend. So she buys a $200,000 policy. 15 years later, she needs help with the activities of daily living, files a claim with the insurance company. 200,000 is paid, she has 200,000 on Medicaid asset protection. She needs more care, applies to Medicaid. Medicaid says, Cindy, you have 1 million. You have earned the right to protect 200,000. The difference of 800,000 must be spent down to poverty level before we will qualify for Medicaid. So what Cindy could have done is, if she had purchased a half a million dollars with 5% compounded automatic inflation protection because all partnership policies require automatic compounded inflation protection, no lower than 3%. If she had purchased half a million with 5% compounded, which you have a daily benefit cap in your overall pool of money that goes up by 5%. With 5% compounded after 14 years, she would have doubled her half a million dollars of insurance to 1 million. And if someday she had Alzheimer's or whatever the situation is and earned 1 million of asset protection, 
then she would have been able to transfer one million without any penalties. David here is an example of somebody who David did not know about the partnership and met with an insurance agent not certified to sell partnership policies. And the agent can only speak about what he or she is licensed to do. So therefore there was no conversation of the partnership. David buys a 200,000 non-partnership policy, which does not have any Medicaid asset protection. 15 years later, Dave files a claim. 200,000 is paid in a year and a half. He has no Medicaid asset protection, still needs care, applies to Medicaid. Medicaid says, David, you have $200,000 in assets. You have zero Medicaid asset protection. Therefore, $200,000 must be spent down to $1,600 in order for David to qualify for Medicaid. Now, keep in mind, I'm focusing on the nursing home because that's where the, usually the largest expenses are, but through Medicaid, you can also apply for one of the two home care programs. One is a Medicaid home care program. One is the state uh, home care program for the elders. And, and so when you apply to Medicaid, they will tell you if you qualify for one of those two for, for home care. And there are also some um, assisted living facilities, but they're very difficult uh, to get in. So that might not be an easy option under Medicaid. We want to point out that Medicaid asset protection is something the state is doing for us. It does not cost one extra penny to have Medicaid asset protection because if you were to get a long-term care quote from a insurance company that sells both partnership and non-partnership, the premium would be exactly the same as long as you're comparing apples to apples. Obviously, if you're comparing a motorcycle to a tricycle, then there's a big difference in the performance and the effectiveness and the quality and, and what you can do with one versus the other. Uh, a partnership policy with 3% compounded automatic inflation protection obviously will be more expensive than a non-partnership policy that may have simple inflation at 3%. So with compounding, the benefits will grow much, much uh, to a greater number, a greater level, and therefore it does cost more if you're comparing with an inferior product. Another advantage of the partnership is that the state is required by the federal law to recover those assets that, or those funds that the state paid for the individual's long-term care in, in the nursing home. However, if those assets were protected through the partnership, then the state will not go after to recover those funds. So it's another advantage of the partnership. You have to be a Connecticut resident when you purchase a policy. Just provide a bona fide Connecticut address, not a work address or a PO box. Since we haven't found anybody that lives in a PO box yet, but you never know. Um, it does not mean you live in Connecticut 12 months out of the year. You could be here three weeks. Once you submit the application, nobody keeps track of what you do. Therefore, you, you don't have to pay taxes here. You don't have to live here, but just initially you provide a bona fide Connecticut address. Now, your address is going to be important uh, besides when you first enroll. It's also going to be important later on. In uh, January 1st, 2009, the federal government came out with a reciprocity compact. All the new states at the time, and there were 41 of them, automatically had reciprocity with each other. And four states, which were considered the original four states, Connecticut, New York, Indiana, and California, we had to apply for reciprocity. And three out of the four did. We're very strongly in favor 
of reciprocity because somebody is going to ask, well, I don't know if I'm going to live in Connecticut forever. You know, I have relatives in South Carolina or my son or daughter is in Michigan, whatever. So the way reciprocity works is as follows. Let's say we buy a policy in Connecticut and then we move anywhere else in the country, the policy will pay insurance benefits. And as insurance benefits are paid, we're getting the Medicaid asset protection. Let's say that 10 years from now, I move to Florida. And unfortunately, an accident happens, I need long-term care. I file a claim with the insurance company. They begin to pay benefits based on the contract I purchased with the insurance company. $1 pay gives you $1 of Medicaid asset protection. As long as when I run out of insurance, Florida and Connecticut have reciprocity with each other, then I can apply to Florida's Medicaid program and they will recognize the Medicaid asset protection that I have earned through the Connecticut Partnership Policy and protect my assets. If for some reason at that time, 10 years from now, if Florida and Connecticut opted out of the reciprocity compact, then my choices would be to either move to a state that has reciprocity with Connecticut or take advantage of the Medicaid asset protection or return to Connecticut or if I stayed in Florida, then I would not have Medicaid asset protection. Now, since 2009, no state has opted out of the reciprocity agreement. And the reason why I'm, I'm telling you these uh, details is because states have the right to opt out of the reciprocity agreement by sending the federal government a letter 60 days in advance of wanting to make a change. Again. No state has opted out. In general, this is a great um, advantage to have the ability to move from state to state because people will move. And so you don't want to uh, penalize your residents by imposing rules where they will lose their Medicaid asset protection without having reciprocity. But we don't know anything is possible uh, things can change five, ten years down the road, tomorrow, six months, six years. One last thing about reciprocity or two. If I was in Florida and I applied to the Florida Medicaid program and I was accepted and three months later, Florida and Connecticut for some reason opted out of the reciprocity agreement, then I would be grandfathered in because I already was in the Florida Medicaid program and they recognize my asset protection. What else did I wanted to tell you about reciprocity? California is the only state that does not have reciprocity. That's the decision they made from day one, which is not a real good decision for California residents. Because let's say you're a California resident for 30 years and you have the California partnership policy, then you move to Montana or Nevada or Washington or Connecticut or whatever state. As long as California continues not to have reciprocity, then somebody who moved to Florida from California would have to return to California to take advantage of the Medicaid asset protection, which you know, once you move 10, 15 years go by or whatever amount of time, if you moved for a certain reason, you may not want to move back. There's indication that California was thinking of changing and agreeing or uh, uh, joining the reciprocity agreement, but with everything that's been going on in California right now, that's most definitely taking a back seat and we'll see what happens in the near future. There are three insurance companies Today, they sell partnership policies. We've had 25 since 1992, three, six, seven, four, eight. Uh, insurance companies make decisions on what they think is best for their business. So today, we have three insurance companies, and even though an insurance company may not be listed here, that does not mean 
that if you have a policy with them, that they no longer have long-term care. They are 100% responsible to service, administer, pay claims, and support the, their long-term care and, and partnership policies. Uh, but if you want to purchase a policy today, tomorrow, uh, you would approach one of these three. Please keep in mind the following. Genworth currently allows sales of policies through their internal sales staff. So you call Genworth by going on their website, you can get a phone number, ask to speak with someone who's certified to sell partnership policies. This way you can get different quotes. And, and don't be shy to ask a lot of different combinations. Um, the other two, you can contact Bankers Life, Transamerica Life. People ask us, who can I call? Well, we can't lean towards one person or what an agency or one company, but you may want to ask your financial advisor or an insurance agent that you trust, that you do business with, ask them uh, who do they, do they know or recommend to speak to about possibly obtaining a partnership quote. So if you go on their website and you ask for someone to contact you, make sure you specify you would like to speak with someone who is certified to sell partnership policies. Otherwise, they'll send anybody and you may not be able to get to, to at least review the information you would like to see. Now, if someone um, missed tonight's uh, presentation and would like to see it, as Christina mentioned earlier, the presentation has been recorded, is recording. You can also go on our website here, ctpartnership.org, and there are two presentations there. One is very similar to tonight's presentation, and the other one is frequently asked questions, which repeats a lot of what I said tonight. You can also call this number, 800 number, if you would like for the partnership to send you or relatives or somebody a consumer packet. If you like, you can go to our website and you can download pretty much everything as you see fit. So you don't need to wait for the mail, but it is up to you, whichever way you like to go. I'm also going to give you a telephone number if you have a pen and paper nearby, and that's for the partnership helpline. And that number is 860-418-6. 318-860-418-6318. We are the state. We're not in the business of selling policies. We're just trying to help people to get uh, accurate information and uh, ask questions without any pressure of having to buy anything. All right, uh, again, my name is Aldo Piantano. When you call that number, you can also ask for me. Sometimes I'm not there. My uh, first name is spelled A-L-D as in David O. The last name, Piantano, P-A-N-T-A-N-O. And having said that, thank you all so much for sticking with uh, the presentation. And let's see if we have some questions that uh, can be addressed. Christina, if you're there, the floor is yours. I got, I got a question. Yes, sir. If I have, let's say I have $500,000 worth of insurance, long-term insurance, and, uh, when, and, and my company paid the $500,000. However, my monthly cost for that insurance as far as paying the nursing home, let's say I got $200 a day, but the nursing home is charging $220 a day. So every day I have to pay $20 out of my pocket to offset the cost of my coverage. Yeah. When do I, am I abil ability to go on Medicaid? Because, um, you know, I, I've used the $200,000, the insurance company paid out the $200,000. I paid money out of my pocket to offset because I wasn't, the daily rate wasn't as enough. At that point, okay. do I want Medicaid and protect the rest of my assets? Let's say I have $200,000 worth of assets. All right. So it's very important that we get this right. So this way, 
is, is clearer to you as far as the answer. The, the first thing we start off with, you have an, a Connecticut partnership policy, correct? You would yes. have a partnership policy. Yes. And how much is the total pool of money for that policy? Half a million? No, the, the policy is unlimited. Unlimited. All right. Well, there you are presenting a little bit of different scenario. And, and let me explain why. When you have unlimited coverage, which some people do, and by the way, for anybody who's not familiar, unlimited means that the insurance benefits will be paid for as long as you live. Now, if you, when you started out, you selected a high daily benefit amount, and let's say, I'm gonna give you different scenarios. Let's say it's $400, and the cost of care is $400, therefore, your insurance is paying $400, and you don't have any out-of-pocket expense. Now, let's say that your partnership policy pays you know, you purchased a lower daily benefit, $200. Let's say it pays $200. If your out-of-pocket expense is $200, you are earning the right to protect $200,000 because that's how much your partnership policy, well, okay, I, I, I jumped to a, a different amount here. You have unlimited coverage. The only way you will qualify for Medicaid is if your daily cost is high enough where you're paying out of pocket every day and slowly you start to tap your assets. And if you were to spend down your assets to the amount of how much the partnership policy has paid out on your behalf, that's how much you will be able to protect when going to Medicaid and this is complicated. The insurance company is unlimited, will pay benefits for as long as you live, and then any out-of-pocket expense that you have, then Medicaid will pay for that extra expense. So you're presenting a very unique situation and it, it requires more details. Uh, I, I would love to speak with you if you wanted to uh, by, by calling me separately. When I bought the policy, it was I bought it like 20 years ago, it was $200 a day. And now because it compounds, it's pretty close to probably would have cost per day for care, but it might not be. So maybe every day I got to pay $50 a day for which every day for the rest of my life because it, it doesn't reach that point. When, when do I stop paying the $50 and uh, the state kicks in, or do I pay that 50 or 60 or $70 a day? Because I'm never gonna reach a maximum. The insurance company's always gonna pay. Okay, so what would happen is you need to look, look, and I, I don't need to know, but you would need to look at how much assets you have, okay? Yep. Let's say, I'm gonna give you an easy example. Uh, let's say that's not the case, but let's say that you had $100,000 in assets, okay? Mm -hmm. Just 100,000, you're single and that's all you have. Now, your insurance policy every day will pay up to the daily benefit amount. And let's say that you have an expense out of pocket, $50. Now. As your insurance policy begins to pay benefits, once your policy is paid out $100,000, which matches how much assets you have, at that point, you can apply to Medicaid, and Medicaid says, you have assets worth $100,000, you have earned the right to protect $100,000. At that point, you qualify for Medicaid, and Medicaid would pay the extra out of pocket for as long as you live and you need care instead of you paying for it. So your policy basically has to pay a certain amount of insurance benefits until it matches how much assets you have. At that point, when your 
policy has paid out enough to match how much assets you have. Six months before you contact Medicaid and you file a claim and you explain the situation. Now, before you ran out of insurance, you were uh, paying a certain amount, no, not before you ran out of insurance, before you um, reached the payments of the insurance company that equaled your amount of assets. You had an out-of-pocket expense. Once your insurance has paid enough money to equal the total assets that you have, at that point, any out-of-pocket expense that you have because you qualified for Medicaid, then Medicaid would pick up that expense for you. That answers my question. Okay, I, great. I, it's a little bit complicated. <laughs> the, price, the price of this has really skyrocketed. Uh, and every year it skyrockets. The only thing that keeps me going is I say, geez, if I do anything with this and I ever need long-term care, it's, it could be one or two years worth of long-term care if, 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 30, if I pay for this for 30 more years. Uh, you are 100% accurate. And the thing here is in the many phone calls that we get, sometimes people in a private telephone conversation, we can say, well, how much assets do you really have? How much assets do you wish to protect? If somebody, for example, has $400,000 of assets, do they really need to have the unlimited coverage if some option for, let's say, half a million dollars may save them a lot of money in premium? So those are some of the discussions that we have. And we're not telling you you should do this or that. We're just trying to discuss options that you may not be thinking about. And by you calling our phone number, then we can have a, a, a very nice conversation, which usually can last 30, 40 minutes. And uh, obviously we don't have time to do so tonight, but you're thinking along the right line. Okay, thank you, Richard. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Uh, my wife and I each have a policy. What effect does that have on protection? Okay. Uh, we have a couple, each one has a policy. How does that work as far as the Medicaid asset protection? So you should keep in mind that only the spouse who files a claim is the one earning Medicaid asset protection. All right, so let's say that you end up in the nursing home and your policy pays $300,000 and you're running out of insurance. So you feel you still need care and you apply to Medicaid. Your spouse lives at home. She protects the house, the car, up to 50% of your other assets, but no more than 130,380. Then whatever your partnership policy has paid out, 300,000, that is added to the standard protection. So, so it's above and beyond. So somebody could, in this example, protect house, car, 130380 plus $300,000. And once those assets are considered protected, if you felt it would be best to transfer everything under your spouse's name, you have that option or whatever you wish to do. Now, keep in mind one thing. The situation changes. Let's say one spouse goes into the nursing home earns 300,000 of Medicaid asset protection. And unfortunately the person uh, dies. Now the spouse is at home, healthy, uh, owns the house, the car, $300,000 in assets plus 130,000. 10 years later, she has a policy and she needs care. And that policy pays $300,000. So now she has, er, she has earned the right to protect $300,000. When she applies to Medicaid because she's running out of insurance benefits, keep in mind that as a widow, we are qualified as a single person. We no longer have that couple's protection. So with that example, the policy pays for the surviving spouse 
$300,000. She applies to Medicaid. Medicaid says you have protected $300,000 plus $1,600. Then everything else above that, and they don't tell you what assets to protect, you decide. If you have a house in Florida and a condo in Connecticut or vice versa, you can protect one or the other up to the amount of protected assets. But once we're considered a single, the Medicaid treats us as a single person and the uh, married couple protection does no longer apply. Any other questions on that topic or other topics? No, thank you. That was very clear. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Christina, did anybody send a question or are we good in the chat? I sent a question in the chat asking at what age is the recommended age to buy? Yes, at what age is it recommended to buy? This lady called today and she said, I have a policy and I'm wondering if my son should get it and he's 30 years old. So, you know, the, honestly, the standard answer is when do I buy and the best time to buy is yesterday. Uh, we've had situations where a couple comes to one of our presentations and she says, we should do something about this. And he says, ah, no, let's wait until I'm 65 or whatever other reasoning. And then he has a stroke, becomes uninsurable. He no longer can buy insurance because once you have certain conditions, obviously the insurance company doesn't want to take $5,000 from us and then be on the hook to pay $250,000. So we apply through a medical questionnaire. And uh, if we have conditions, um, combination of conditions, uh, then unfortunately we may not be able to buy coverage. And then the later we buy, the premium is much higher because the risk is much greater. Uh, and also you don't have as much time on the, on the compounding of the inflation protection. I mean, some of the people I talk to today that have had a policy for 18, 15, 20 years, it's amazing what they have. They may have $800,000, $900,000 pool of money, daily benefit, $500, $600, and they're in a great position because they probably have a lot more insurance than they need so they can make adjustments to help them uh, control the cost. But the average buyer for the partnership is around 57, the majority of the buyers are between 50 and 60 and 60 to 65. You also have buyers there, 45 to 40. Um, when I was selling group long-term care insurance to employers, the average age was around 46. And that was because you're talking to a younger population, everybody's at work and the pro employer was promoting it, more education and more people were focused on it. So, the sooner we can buy, the better. And obviously, then you got to pay premium. But the way to look at this is, do I want to invest over 20 years, $30,000, $40,000, and perhaps protect $400,000 at some point? As the gentleman uh, pointed out before, he's thinking if he cancels his insurance with unlimited coverage, because the rates can go up. Um, two years of, of, of the cost is going to exceed any premium that he's paying now. So he is protecting his assets and that's a pretty wise decision as long as paying for premium is not a financial burden for him. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, you have our number. There's the 800 number here for consumer packets, uh, also questions. The other number I mentioned before, again, is 860-418-6318. If you think of anything else, if you're talking to an insurance agent, if you would like another opinion, please do call us. We're there to help. We have tremendous experience. And um, thanks so much for your attention. Christina, uh, are you?
uh, in the vicinity. <laughs> Well, in this case, I'm going to say good night, everybody. Stay well, enjoy the holidays, and, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye -bye. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. You take care.